there. So you see how, you know, you can see that as a father and a mother are teaching the child things for him to actually, you know, do that here to Proverbs 6.20, My son, keep thy father's commandment, forsake not the law of thy mother. Bind them continually upon thy heart, and tie them about thy neck. When thou goest, it shall lead thee. When thou sleepest, it shall keep thee. When thou awakest, it shall talk with thee. For the commandment is a lamp, for the law is like the proofs and instruction of the way of life. So think about being the primary influence of the children. The people that spend that they spend the most time with are the ones they are going to be the most like. Right? So who do you want your children to be like? You want your children to be like you. And this is the this is kind of like the shame or the unfortunate thing that if you don't think you are the best influence for your children, you've got to up your game. Right? It's kind of a sad, isn't it a sad state of affairs when you think somebody else is going to be a better influence for your children than yourself. You need to reflect on yourself and think, well, I want to be, you know, a good influence on my children, lead by example, and therefore I want them to spend the most time with us. So that they then start to take on the habits and the convictions and the beliefs and all these things that we have because this is the lifestyle we live and this is what I want our children to have. And you know, you know that you know, our beliefs and our convictions are very minority. You know, so it's, it's not that there is a lot of people out there that can be that example that we want them to be with the convictions that we hold. Right? So not only that. You know, the, most, the people they spend the most time with are the people they're going to emulate the most. But also, you know, you will create like a unique bond and, and role with your child when you're their primary educator, not just their primary carer. You know what I'm saying? Because you might spend a lot of time with them, you know, feeding them, you know, cleaning them, bathing them, getting them ready to go here, to go there, and making sure that they are provided for, right? But that's not the same as being their primary educator. Right? What do I mean by that? It's when kids wonder about things, and they talk about things, and they share their thoughts with you, and things like that. You know, do you really want somebody else to take on that role? You know, the parents should be, you know, have, have that unique role. And that's why, you know, a lot of students, a lot of kids that go to school, you know, they may not confide in their parents. You know, they'll confide in their friends. They'll confide in their teachers. Why? Because the, the teacher and their friends are the ones that are spending time with them and talking with them and, and they're expressing themselves. And, you know, that, and then they, they, they create that unique bond with the child. And really, you want to have, you want to be and have that unique bond and role with that child. And I think that's why if you're their primary educator, you'll make sure that you are that wrong. And the danger of not being that wrong is not knowing everything that's going on with your child. I mean, if something's going on, you want them to be in the habit of talking to you about it, that you're their primary counselor as opposed to somebody else. You know, who may keep <laughs> that information from you, encourage them to go over especially with the way all this gender stuff is going to. You see, you know, a, a huge problem with teachers being the primary educator and the kids like, you know, you say gender dysphoria, you know, which maybe just maybe liking some things that are stereotypically female or stereotypically male, and then they start telling them, maybe you're a female, maybe you're a male, maybe you're not the gender, you are that you're born. So, like I said, you can feed them, you can take them places, you can get them ready for bed, but when do you sit and talk to them about the issues of life and their own thoughts? You know? So you want to be that primary that's one of the benefits of homeschooling is because you're there with them all the time. You know, there's not really that much time in the day. And you're going to be spending that time with them, not just only taking care of them, but them learning and discussing things as they think through things. You know, they learn things and they have thoughts. Who are they going to share those thoughts with? You know, will they share those thoughts with a teacher? You know, and then you may not even know what the conversations that happen between the child and the teacher over the six hours, you know, will your child be able to recap what they were thinking, 
second uh, advantage of homeschooling I want to talk about is protecting them, protecting your children from bad influences. You know, there are a lot of bad influences in the world, uh, bad behavior, language, dress, and you say, like, yeah, but my kids, you know, they hang around with Christian kids, they hang around with, um, you know, they go to a Christian school. Well, that doesn't mean that they're immune to, to bad influences, you know, don't assume that just because, you know, the parents are Christian, just because they're Christian kids, that the standards of these other parents and these other kids are the same as yours. And you'll start to realize as your kids get older, how easy it is for these bad influences to come into your children's life. And you're not there to, to see it, to notice it. And you're not in the role of that primary educator. Will you even know? And that's why sometimes you, you, you see, you know, how many times do you hear about, you know, pastor's kids or Christian parents and you know, the kids, you know, they grew up in church. They had church every week. They went to the Sunday school. They went to the Christian school. And they grow up and they're like worldly acts. Because you, sometimes you wonder, you know, maybe the Christian parents did a lot of things for brought them here, make sure they were involved in this youth activity, went to church, Sunday school, you know, fed them and everything like that. But where were they then primary educated, primary influence? You know? So you can protect them from these negative influences. Bad name, language, dress. And you know, we live in a different day and age now. We live in a day and age with social media and tech. You know, children are becoming worldly and ungodly so much younger and so much faster because of the influence of you know, social media and things like that. So not only social media, you know, and tech is opening new doors that didn't exist before. You know, you have bullying. Bullying happens even amongst Christian kids. You know, and, you know, we you always be there to see it. And kids always tell their teachers what they notice. Um, you know, you've got peer pressure. How many bad things were introduced to you as a child through bad friends? You know, when you think about that, a lot of people they get into pornography, drugs, alcohol, smoking, which they might not otherwise have got into if you know they didn't have that peer pressure. And then you have more serious types of bad, you know, negative things like molestation, right? When they're away for too long. Things like that. False teaching. False philosophies. You know, what about not being supportive if they disagree with something at all? And you know, sometimes bad philosophy is not, doesn't always immediately sound bad. You know, how many people have heard the saying, you know, I don't know people um, tell kids, you know, sharing is caring. And that's true to a certain extent, but sometimes it's used to, you know, make, make kids always have to share everything that they have. And, and sometimes kids, or use that phrase because they want things from other kids. Not sharing is caring. Is, is that a philosophy that's being taught? Where you know, people don't have to take ownership of their own things, right? And what about the danger of a school, you know, maybe protecting the bull as opposed to protecting the children and afterwards? You know, maybe a child will stand up for themselves because they're being moved. Will they be supportive? You know, will they be supportive of standing up for themselves or will they just be treated like all? So, this is not an exhaustive list, but I'm just trying to write down some of the things that, you know, are negative influences out. And, you know, if you homeschool, which means you spend more time with your children, you will see these things happen in your children's life. Right, let's look at a few verses here. Proverbs 13, 20. He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. You know so who you associate with and you spend a lot of time with, it matters. Right? 1 Corinthians 15, be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. And I wanted to go to Ephesians 4 as well, 14, to show that you know, children are so easily influenced. You know, and you'll start to notice that. Like I said, I, I didn't really think about it so much when my children were younger. But now that my children are older, I mean, I, we homeschool our kids. Our, our kids have very limited interaction with other kids. You know, we they go to an event, and the kids at jiu-jitsu. But, you know, we've had you know, kids at jiu-jitsu even like, show things to our kids on their iPhones and on their iPads because, you know, their parents don't have the same controls that we have, but 
we like lock down certain apps, we don't just give them free reign on YouTube and all that sort of stuff. But the other parents don't. And you know, this is the thing, right? Like, you know, you learn like the kids are like, extremely sneaky. You know, they know how to hide things from parents. You know, they 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 you know, they won't always let up that like, this person is showing them this and this kid is showing them that. You know, because they know, you know, in their heart that mom and dad's not gonna be happy with that, right? And what you're opening your children up to when you are just not there for like huge swags of the day is just more opportunity for these things to happen. Because even at Christian schools, kids are allowed to bring phones and stuff. So what are these kids going to be like showing and telling your kids, you know, on the playground, you know, you think a, a teacher that has to look after 10, 20, 30 kids is going to be attentive to your child. So, this is one thing that's an advantage of homeschooling, so you can make sure. You can pick up these things, you know, because how are you going to pick up on these things if you're not around? If you don't see them, I mean, life is hard enough to pick up on these things, and we are around, you know? I can imagine, like, picking up on all these things if I don't see them five days a week, six, six hours of the day, you know, the things that they're getting up to with other kids. So, also, you know, with younger kids, sometimes children, and, and Obviously, I can only speak from experience at the age, you know, Simon's age. But sometimes children struggle to articulate what is destroying their confidence. You know, and if you don't see it, let's say like your child's going to school and they come back and you start to notice a change in their behavior, things like that. And, you know, sometimes children can't articulate what is destroying their confidence, what's affecting them. But if you can see what's happening, you know, if you have to be there more often, and you can explain to them, and you can help them to, to go, go through these struggles in their lives. Right? So I definitely believe, especially when kids are younger, you know, like children, they toss to and fro. Uh, I don't know if I read this verse. So we hence what we don't want children, toss to and fro, carry them out with every good doctrine, by the slight of men and kind of craftiness, whereby they lie away from the sea. So the Bible likens us, you know, we should not be like children that are just so easily influenced here and there. And then you, the Bible uses that analogy because children are easily influenced, right? They are easily taught wrong things and whatnot. And, you know, will you be able to undo all these wrong things that they might have been influenced or taught if you don't even know everything that's been taught around there? Right? <coughs> Sometimes we just assume because it's like a Christian teacher or a decent teacher and they're necessarily going to be
They say, I went to school and I didn't turn out that bad. You know, usually what people mean by that is that my child wasn't like a murderer or a rapist or anything or a drug addict. And, and I sometimes think, like, is that, is that the standard that we have for our kids? You know, when people say, my kids didn't, you know, I didn't turn out that bad, that I was a rapist or a drug addict, things like that. You know, I want my kid, I want my kids to love God. I want my kids to know, you know, about the Lord. I want them to love the Lord. Like, it's like a higher standard. I want them soul winning. I want those, these things for them. Right? So my standards are a lot higher than just, you know, they really turn out to be a drug addict or an alcoholic or anything like that. So, if one of the advantages of homeschool is that you can protect them from a lot of these bad influences, and I think if you're not with your children for the most part of the day, and the most productive part of the day, that you really roll the dice with who your teachers are, and the children they hang out with, and that they, if something is wrong, that they will reveal that to you, right? That you will be privy to it. Because if you're not, then how do you deal with it? Right? Alright, let's go on to number three. So the third advantage of homeschool is I think you will give them a better education. You will give them a better education. Now, I need a bit of a caveat here because it really depends on what you value. Right? Great thing because you know, I don't know if you guys remember that movie, I think it was Bruce or 
right, it's just like, it was like a joke about whether a man could do the job of God, right? And it's like, well, how does he answer like all these prayers? And he's on the computer, and he's like, he's like, I will we'll bring all the prayers in on an email. And he's like, it replied to all the emails. But it just goes to show that, you know, like businesses, they, they really struggle to treat customers individually because they don't have, you know, the, the resources to be able to treat people as individuals, right? God fortunately does. Matthew 10, 29, not two sparrows sold for a father, one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. So you see, it's like God in heaven, he knows when he converts fall to the ground. And it says here, look, but the very hairs of your head are numbered. So that's the ideal scenario, right? The ideal scenario is that you have individual learning, even in jiu-jitsu, right? You can only learn so much in a group setting. Most people say you want to excel in jiu-jitsu, then you have to take private lessons. What a private lesson? That's when you can work with an instructor and you can see it. Know, how you're developing, what your specific issues are, and things like that. And that's one of the advantages of homeschool, right? <clears throat> and nowadays, you know, teachers are overworked and they're underpaid. It makes you wonder, like, you know, will a teacher with 20 to 30 students really do a better job than a mother with four to five at, at different ages? And that's if you even have four or five children. You know, if you have more, if you have less. You know, that doesn't mean you can't, like I said at the beginning, homeschooling doesn't mean you can't source outside help. Right? There are things that you can do to help, but like I said, you're still the primary educator and you are there with your children. Right? You're, you're there noticing what's going on. You're there to counsel them, to guide them, and things like that as well. Individual learning, what else? It's more custom and tailored to their personal needs. You know, you can pursue interests that are more useful to them. You know, you don't have to go into some cookie cutter way of whatever they develop for all children. You can tailor it to your child. I mean, even when I see amongst my children, even when I see amongst like my children, you know, they all have different interests. And I'm, I'm curious to see like as they get older, like what career path they choose, because I can already see the different strength and different abilities that they have, just how they go about things. You know, so it's gonna be interesting to see like how they develop. Um, they can learn skills that are more practical for them. Like I said, group learning must cater to the majority of what learn in different ways. Um, you know, how much individual attention will they get? You know, sometimes when you bring your children to like a group class and the coach or whatever never spends really any time with your children, you know, you just gotta hope that the coach spends equal time with the children and, and spends time developing them and things like that. That's what you've got to kind of hope for when you put them into a class. And you can make sure that they get that attention because they're your child. Now, a parent might say, well, you know, they're not an expert. You know, they're not an expert teacher, they're receiving training or things like that. And what I would say to that is, I don't, it's not as difficult as you think. Do you know what I mean? I think we just put too much, you know, what does it really mean to be a good teacher? You know, like, just, just be a good parent. You know, just teach, just have, give your child attention. You know, help them to learn things. The things that they're learning, like I said, is not that difficult at the young ages. So the more difficult thing is just being patient, spending time with your children. But these are the same skills you need to develop as a parent either way. See, you can't outsource the parenting job. It's not like now that you have your kids going to school, then you don't have to be their parent. Then you don't have to counsel them. You don't have to you know, be patient with them and teach them other things. So, parenting will never be outsourced. And the same skills you need as a parent, the same skills that will make you a good teacher. And you know, there are good teachers, but there are also bad teachers. <laughs> right? What percentage of teachers do you think are good? You know, it's a bit of a lack of a draw, right? And you send your kids to school, you know? Is the teacher that's going to be teaching your child a good teacher? Right? Or are they just somebody that's been in the job for a long time. So, you know, there's a lot of teachers like that. They've just been in the job for a long time. And they're not really a good teacher, but they just have a lot of tenure. So, not only that, but when you teach your children, you're going to become better as well. The more you do, you'll become more knowledgeable. You'll become a better parent, better teacher, better counselor. Because now, you know, you don't just focus on getting better at a career, Right? You get better at focusing how to actually raise your children. And the more you do it, the better 
you're going to get at. So anything new, look, all of us have been first time parents, right? <coughs> like those of us who are Yeah, that was a daunting thing. Right? Now you've got, you know, those of you who have children, you know, well, if you have children, now you know what it's like. Right? And you but it's gonna be the same as when you teach. Look, it's a bit daunting at first, but you can do it. You know, any anybody's mundane job in their work was was daunting for somebody. You know, they didn't know how to do it. The more they do it, the better they get. Teaching is the same. And one thing, one thing a teacher cannot do. I send them to a school. Teachers take care of them six hours of the day. One thing the teacher cannot do is what. Spank your children, right? When they need it. You know, sometimes children need to get smacked, right? Otherwise, you know, when, when parents don't smack their children when they need it, sometimes they only resort to pacifying them, keeping them happy, you know, and other ways to sort of punish them through, you know, an embarrassment and things like that. But they won't be able to spank your children when they need to. And in Proverbs 23 12, apply thine heart unto instruction. Ears to the words of knowledge. Withhold non correction from the child, for if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod, and shalt deliver his soul from hell. My son, if thy heart be wise, my heart shall rejoice even more. Yea, my reins shall rejoice when my lips speak right things. Right? So, there's not going to be any spanking in schools. Will they be corrected when the error happens? You know, will the teacher even have time to discipline your child when they're playing up, right? When they have so many other children to take care of, right? So they're not going to get the attention that they, they deserve, maybe even in education, but even in discipline, they may not get the, uh, the attention they deserve. So how much more poor behavior are they getting away with when you didn't see them the whole time, all right? So that's the third advantage of homeschooling. Last one. Last one, and I think this really is the unrivaled benefit of homeschool, is spending more time with your children. You'll have more time with them. James 4.14 Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, but what is your life? It is even a vapour that appeareth for a little time, and then vanisheth for a while. And I think, I think a lot of us, because we're all young, you know, a lot of us, all of us here are young parents. Right? Uh, We're young parents, and I think you know it's it's very hard to think about how like quick life goes when your children are young. You know, I, I feel that the older my children get, the faster I realise life is going and how short life is. You know, you look at you know I probably say this all the time when we talk about how short life is. You know, look at you know, younger pictures of the children. You know, and I realise that you know my time just went so quick. Uh, but at the time, you know, you think it's going very slow. But, you know, you look back at it, you know, it's so quick. I mean, we were talking just at soccer yesterday. You know, that silence is almost 12 years old. Alex made the comment that four years is going to start right. <laughs> How much time do we really have? So, this is what I think, you know, this is what I reflect on sometimes, is that, you know, you don't really have that much time with your children, even during the week. Busy, you know, you do work, and, and, and you know, especially when you have a few young kids, you're taking your kids to like activities and things like that. So I was reflecting with Elizabeth, and we're saying, look, <clears throat> let's say, let's say we took our kids to school. You, you'd have to go to sleep a lot early, right? Because they need to wake up, and they need to wake up early to go to school, right? And then there's the whole rush of like having to get dressed, having to get lunch. Well, all this stuff takes time. Right? So there you go. You're going to wake up early, and this is the rush of just getting them ready, getting their lunch, getting them dressed, getting them in the car, taking them to school. And now, six hours, you're going to see this. Then you might go and do something. Else. You might go and do right? Then you pick them up. And then there's a the rush of picking them up, getting them in the car, getting them there, and then, and you, then you might have after school activities. After school activities, take them to school. 
sport and you have different aims than me. Like after school activities on Mondays, like you know, I take my kids to soccer on Mondays. That's like three hours, like four thirty to seven thirty. Right? Because there's gonna be young kids and the old kids. Right? So we have after school activities because you know it's not just school. We want to do things after school as well. Then what happens? Then you get home, and you eat dinner, right? Shower, brush teeth, get ready to bed, cut the tattoo late, right? Because then they're going to wake up, do it all again. So then I think, so, so when, is, when is the actual time in the day? You know, because unfortunately we fill our lives with so much activity, because we want our kids to you know, participate in all these different things. But like, that's what I'm saying, you, might, you may see your kids a lot, and you might you know, be in the same room. When you, when you actually sit down with them and you talk to them and teach them and things like that, it's six hours of the day that they're at school, that's what's happening. You know, it's, it's, it's giving, being given to somebody else. So that time during the day where Elizabeth is sitting with them, going through their schoolwork, it's not just about, you know, it's not just about teaching them how to read and write. Like this click, like don't think that home school is like this. Because sometimes I think that's what we thought. And then we realize differently as we homeschooled. That it's just like throughout the day, it's just like this clinical school of like they do their exercises and they learn how to read and they learn how to write. That's not only what happens during homeschool. You know what happens during homeschool? They learn something, they ask you about it. They think about this, they express these things to you. And this is what I mean by like you're building this relationship with your children that if they did that at a school, you know who they're building their relationship with? The teacher, right? And is it even that good of a relationship where the teacher has several children in the class, but you know, I suppose if that's what they're dedicated to doing, they're now fulfilling that role that you could have, right? So time goes so quick. Time with your children is short. Look at this verse, I'm just disciplined. You're chasing my son while there is hope. Let not my soul spare for his crime. Right? So we have a limited time with our children. You know, a lot of people say like, you know, those early years, like the formative years of their life, when they build their habits and build their character, who are they going to emulate? You know, and that, you know, like I said, when you're going through it, you think it's very slow. Until your children are 10, 15, you think, where did all the time go? And you know, when you don't appreciate the time that you're having with them. Get busy with other things, and then you realize I really didn't spend that much time with the children. Now they're adults, now they have their own mind. And now I have to try and influence, it's a lot harder to have influence and to train up your child, right? The Bible says, train up your child in the way he should go. When he is old, he will not depart from it. So these formative years, you have more one on one time, more shared experiences. Even, you know, when you homeschool, the siblings have more shared experiences together. Because when you send your kids all to school, they're all in different years, it's more with their friends that they build you know, not so strong relationships with their siblings as well. So these more shared experience with siblings because they're not always split up. And you know, it's like, you know, you, you, you never really appreciate the mundane things in life until later. Like you might just think like, you know, you know, te- you're teaching with your children and it's just like, ah, oh, you know, you're frustrated with it and everything like that. Um, or even just something as mundane as just, you know, sitting around and doing the tennis, right? But I'm sure many of you, is, I don't know if you guys do this, but you know, sometimes you'll, you'll watch back like old videos, old photos, and you just happen to take that mundane video and just sitting around and doing the tennis, right? And the, you didn't realize like how precious that moment was until you reflected on it later. And you know, when your children grow up, they're learning things. You know, it might be it might be difficult, it might be hard and frustrating at the time. But it's like you won't you won't recognize the, the how do I describe this? Like how precious that moment is until later. And I think if you send your kids to school and you don't spend all that time with them when they're younger. You're going to realize that you gave all these precious moments to somebody else. Because precious moments are like, you know, when they first learn something, when they first learn how to you know, even talk, or they learn something, all these sorts of things. And yeah, 
yes, life can be full of them, even if you send your kids to school. But there's just a lot that you missed out on as well because the teacher got to experience that and not you. Right? So why give these precious experiences to another person? And I think you know, as your children get older, I guess if you look back on these moments that you thought were frustrating or annoying or mundane, and you realize that these were precious moments, and you'll be glad that you experienced that, you know, and you were, you were there. So, in conclusion, so what were the four benefits that I talked about today, four advantages of homeschooling? First one was, you want to be their primary influence. And if you're spending the most time with them, you will ensure you are their primary influence. You will be able to better protect them from bad influences because you spend more time with them. You will give them a better education. And remember, it's not just about information, it's not just about resources. You know, what's more important, I believe, is character development and the relationship that you're building with them. Right? Because that's going to last a lifetime. You want to build that relationship with your children so that when they're older, do they come to you or do they go to somebody else? Right? And the last time one, spending more time with them. Life is so short. And, you know, because life is short, the time you have with your children is even shorter as well. So, last thought is, you know, homeschooling is not easy. You know, I'm not going to pretend that, you know, raising your children, teaching them things is easier than delegating that work to somebody else. Obviously that's easy. But what I will say is, it, it's not as hard as you might think either. You know, I don't think homeschooling is as hard as people think it is. I think just because it's something you're not necessarily know, you know, it's a, it's a new frontier for things. So it, it's more daunting than what you might, what, what, what it actually is. But ultimately, I think the extra effort is worth it. And I think God has given you your children, He's given you the ability, He's not put anything in your life more than you can overcome. So I think you can do it. And I think it is worth it. So Philippians 4 13, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthen me. So I hope uh, that was a good. Blessing to you, learn a bit, and also a good reminder for those of you who do want to learn a bit that you, know, you can pocket these sort of advantages. So when you talk to people, I think it's uh, good to know. Alright, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for uh, your, your word, we thank you for the children that have given us, pray that you give us wisdom to raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Help us to be their primary influence, build a strong relationship with them, Lord. Also,